Hello and welcome to the Boston Herald podcast. My name is Harold Lapidus and today's special guests are Mark Arnold and Charles Rosenay. How do you pronounce your last name exactly? Exactly like that, Rosenay. Oh, excellent. And um, uh, Rosenay with three exclamation points. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, they've, um, they both, uh, each of them have written uh, books before, but we're gonna focus uh, today on a band called the Turtles that had plenty of hits in the in the in the sixties, most notably um, "Happy Together." And the middle eight was written. I'm in I'm in uh, Massachusetts, and the middle eight was written in Air, Massachusetts, at a diner a couple of towns away. And also, <laughs> and um, the song "Eleanor." Those are the two that I knew when I was a kid. And um, and the two lead singers, uh, Howard Kalin and uh, Mark Volman, uh, they later had to change their names to the fluor fluorescent leech and Eddie, and then uh, then Flo and Eddie. Um, uh, they've been radio DJs. They've been part of uh, Zappa's Frank Zappa's Mother's Inventions, produced by Ray Davies of the Kinks. Ray Davis of the Kinks. Dave says Davies. Ray says Davis. Um, uh, <laughs> champions, uh, early champions of Warren Zevon. Um, the ridiculous amount of hit records they've sung on, uh, like Bang a Gong by T Rex and A Hungry Heart by Bruce Springsteen. And I remember uh, when I was a kid, and I couldn't go to every concert I wanted. I remember starting. I'm from New York originally, and in the New York Times. Alice Cooper Billion Dollar Babies tour with the fluorescent Leech and Eddie opening. I don't know if that's the first time I heard of them, but um, um, but I do, you know, I have some of their records. You can see them. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and um, and uh, to me, there there were um, the whole story is wild. I mean, the whole trajectory of their career, no one, I don't think, it predicted. They weren't exactly the most. Um, you know, there were two lead singers in, a, in the same band. Uh, they were called the Turtles, which was, you know, there were the birds and the monkeys and the beetles and everything, and the Turtles you know, following that. Uh, they spelled it correctly, but still. <laughs> and, um, and uh, yeah, that early on, you could tell their um, uh, humor because their song Eleanor is like, you're my pride and joy, et cetera. Even as a kid, I just, I just love that line. It was just hilarious. <laughs> Um, but, um, but what I didn't realize as a kid was they had plenty more hits. I just know it was the turtles, like, uh, she'd rather be with me and then, and their version of it ain't me, babe. So, um, uh, so I want to, uh, so we have, um, if you could each, uh, introduce yourselves a little bit, uh, I guess Mark go first cause you're on top <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, explain, uh, uh, explain, uh, describe, uh, some of the, uh, the, you know, this isn't your first book and everything. So, uh, uh talk a little bit about about your accomplishments okay um my name is mark arnold uh i have written about 15 books maybe over 15 books at this point uh covering the gamut of subjects that i'm interested in which are comic books and animation and tv and movie and music and uh my first book, well, I originally did a fanzine years ago about Harvey Comics. It's Casper and Richie Rich. And my first book was self-published just to see if I could do it. And I basically did a best of compilation of uh, the best of the Harveyville fun times. And uh, it actually did pretty well. Um, and I was writing articles and various things. Uh, I wrote an article about Underdog which caught the eye of the publisher of Bear Manor Media and uh, wrote a book about that company. And uh, then I wrote a book about uh, Cracked Magazine, two volume set. I wrote books about Dennis Semenis and Pink Panther. And uh, uh, as far as music goes, I did a Beatles book, two Monkeys books, and now the Turtles book. So um just a wide variety of things. I also have my own podcast called the Fun Ideas Podcast, which is what, what, what is it? What is the name of the it's, podcast? It's called Fun Ideas Podcast. Ah, okay, which is an excuse to uh, audibly interview all the subjects that end up, you know, being referenced in my book. So, <laughs> <laughs> and it was very, very helpful for our turtles book, which I'll hold up now, um, because we actually have transcribed about fifteen of such interviews. So that also aired on the podcast. So. Cool. And that's where I'm at. Where I'm at. <laughs> All right. You're up to the turtles. And Charles, um, uh, yeah, you're next. <laughs> um, been a Beatles guy for a very long time, producing Beatle conventions and festivals since 1978. I do the Beatle tours 
to Liverpool for the fans who want to go to London and Liverpool with me uh, since 1983. We just celebrated our 40th anniversary doing that. For about 20 years, I published a Beatles magazine called Good Day Sunshine. Oh, I also, remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's where I know you from. I, I knew <laughs> I knew it was a Beatles connection. I just didn't I couldn't place it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> also did uh, the Boston Beatle conventions in the 80s uh, at the Bradford and then some of the other hotels. And then, um, you know, during COVID, uh, I wasn't able to do all the things I could normally do. So I got the itch to start writing again after not doing Good Day Sunshine for many years and started with a, a book called The Book of Top Ten Horror Lists, where 100 celebrities gave me their favorite horror themes. That was followed by a, a True Ghost Stories of Connecticut book. And then everyone was on me. Hey, you're the Beatles guy. How dare you put out a Top Ten Horror List book and not something on the Beatles? And I said, well, I thought everything was done. I mean, you know, there's there may be 30 Dylan books, but there's 3000 Beatle books. <laughs> and uh, I, so it, it made sense to put out the book of top 10 Beatles lists where 64 celebrities, 64, of course, gave me their favorite songs, their favorite themes, their favorite memories and all that. Um, and then knowing what a great job Mark had done, and we'd been friends for a while uh, on putting together similar monkey books thematically where he and another author um, reviewed their songs and it was like a Siskel and Ebert back and forth of you know their opinions on it you know we somehow came up with the idea of doing this uh, Turtles compendium this what we hoped would be the ultimate Turtles discography and book and uh, one big part of it is to cover every one of the songs and each of us give our opinions on each of the songs. And that was one of the things that, that really excited me about working with Mark, because he's he's very studious. He's the uh, researcher, the archivist. He's the one who really digs deep. And I'm the one who wants to have fun with everything. Uh, whereas he's, you know, he's giving the list of who played on each record, when it was released, what album it appears on. I'm saying, hey, it reminds me of this other song, which, and then on and on and on. So it was a back and forth banter that I think makes the book not only um, very nece necessary for people who are, you know, completists and students of the turtles, but fun to read. And I think that makes a big difference. Yeah, definitely. And 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 if if you're buying this book, and you know, uh, it's exactly what you want. Because <laughs> if it's a, um, do you want to know anything about the turtles? I mean, it's all here. I mean, I, I, as as uh, before, I um, looked at this. I had a, yeah. You know, it's hard. It's th their career is all over the place. It, it's hard to even remember what they did because it, it it is it's just a, it's just crazy. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, so why don't you, so, all right. So, uh, you just touched on it, but, um, so what, what do you get in the book? Like if someone, someone, you know, they, they're going to order it online, they can't really look at it. So they, they're interested in the turtles or they're getting a gift. What, what are they getting themselves into? They're <laughs> 400 getting plus not, pages. It's the best so book ever written. <laughs> They're getting yes. not just happy together. Uh -huh. And, you know, it's so important to stress that because the general music fan, the general, you know, my wife, anyone you say, uh, the Turtles, they may or may not know happy together. You sing Imagine Me and you, oh, they know it. It's their favorite song. Yeah. They love it, all that. So this is, a, of course, a deeper dig into their careers. And you said how how ridiculously exhaustive and expansive going from the crossfires to the turtles as we know them with hit after hit, straight on through singing those background songs and then on to Zappa. And uh, it's just ridiculous. Their careers that people probably don't realize. So someone who loves the song is going to learn from the book they're going to discover that it wasn't just a one-hit wonder far from it they're going to um, know the other songs which you know we all know that she'd rather be with me you baby eleanor you showed me you can go on and on with those but i think they're going to love going through the book reading about songs they may never heard of and while they're looking at the book maybe youtubing or googling those certain songs and saying how is this not a hit? How are the turtles? How are the turtles not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? How are they, you know, not recognized as one of the great, you know, hit makers, not just of the '60s, but of all time? And I think that's a big part of um, what we're trying to get across with this book. 
it's also it's separated out in five sections basically so first section is the turtles so if you're a real turtles fan and just want to read about them that's that's the section for you it has the early crossfire stuff up through the turtles career and then the compilations later uh second section is the zappa section for those fans and if you're not a fan you can become a fan um the third section is about flo and eddie's solo stuff that they did uh some of it is remarkably good uh that uh is good as the turtles put out back the first flo and eddie album i think one of the ones you set up uh there was discussion to put that out as a turtles album um the fluorescent leech and eddie but it, they chose to go with the flo and eddie moniker uh the fourth section is when they delved into children's titles they did uh, albums of strawberry shortcake and care bears and gi joe things like that and then the last section is the interviews that charles and i conducted on my podcast and elsewhere um and there's about uh 15 different uh interviews of actual turtles uh people who played with them people who are friends of them people who are just associated with them uh different ways or producers and things like that so it's a well-rounded discussion of this pop group and what they did um so uh i know they rhino records had a lot to do with uh keeping their legacy alive uh did you want to uh talk about that well, also, uh, yeah, I'll say Harold Bronson, one of the founders of Rhino Records, was a huge Turtles fan. And this is at a time when um, Flo and Eddie were still putting out albums. And uh, when they were contacted, apparently uh, Howard Kalin and Mark Goldman were like, why do you want to listen to that old stuff? And he goes, I love it. I want to put it out. <laughs> you know, he talks about it in his uh, Rhino Records story. It's a great book. And we used it as a reference. Um, and... Uh, they struck up such a friendship and such a deal that uh, Rhino was the first label after their original label, White Whale, folded to, well, tell a lie, they actually did do a compilation through Sire Records in the early 70s, but the first full all, all album re-release and even some unreleased stuff. So everything came out under the Rhino label and then some, you know, because they were huge fans at Rhino Records. Yeah, they well, yeah, they must have been one of the first things they ever did, right? Right, um, Rhino. As far Pretty as much, I mean, the first kind of straight thing. I mean, they had like <laughs> Wild Man Fisher, <laughs> Wild Man Fisher, yeah, and the Temple Stop. City Kazoo Orchestra, and maybe Fireside Theater. But I mean, right. you know, Stop. the Turtles was a big yeah. coup for them because once they got the Turtles, later they got the Monkees uh, re-release catalog. And then they got it, it went from there. They got every like major 60s, 70s, 80s uh, artists re released through Rhino. So it was the beginning of a huge success story. And it just started out as a record store in Los Angeles. And, you know, we went from there. And now it's a big mega thing owned by Warner Brothers. So there you go. <laughs> um, and uh, one thing I didn't, I, I saw Roger McGuinn uh, a few years back before the pandemic. And I didn't realize he wrote one of the Turtles hits. Oh, yeah. I think that's why uh, you showed me. You know, yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And the funny story on that, I'll tell the story. Chip Douglas tells it in our book, too, is Chip Douglas was producing that particular piece and that album at the time. And he had this old organ that didn't work very well. And so he was doing this this very slow you know he could pump it so fast so that's how they got that slow rhythm and he says i'm sorry my my organ is up to snuff it's not that great it's like doon, 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 doon. and they said we love it we want it that slow but it worked because it makes it really psychedelic and kind of weird and different yeah, because if you listen to the original birds version they did a demo version years earlier and it's it's like mid 60s power pop it's like do 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 you know like that and it's like you know not not the almost not the same song you know so <laughs> um you know what's interesting is is a la the monkeys and so many other bands you know the turtles wrote some of their stuff Flo and eddie wrote some of their stuff but a lot of outside writers wrote stuff for them but they played on everything you know when you think about bands from that era whether it was monkeys or or beach boys mamas and the pop as herman's hermits on and on and on dave clark five they were the vocals they might have toured 
but it was um, a lot of studio musicians, the Wrecking Crew playing uh, on the records with the Turtles. And, and that's probably because their label, White Whale, was so cheap and they didn't want to hire outside musicians to come in and do sessions. It was the Turtles playing every note, you know, it was the guys doing every vocal and background harmony and every every lick on every record, which was very unusual aside from, you know, the Beatles come to mind as that. But not a lot of the bands in, in that era uh, were doing were doing all their own stuff. Um, and there, uh, since uh, I'm known for my Dylan stuff. Uh, I, I, I have a book too. <laughs> and I, in it, I, um, uh, uh, I wrote about, um, uh, a little bit about it and how their, um, first album had, I think four Dylan songs on it. And, um, so, yeah. <laughs> and, and then, um, uh, I guess there was this, um, quote, which I, I, I know it's in your book too, but, uh, you know, that, um, he heard the, the, the turtles performance of, of, uh, it ain't me, babe. And, <laughs> and then he said, that's a great song. It should be a record. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. <laughs> and the woman and and Kaylin says, "But Bob, we already recorded it. It was a hit. You wrote it." <laughs> so. Um, and he even mentioned the turtles in in passing in that No Direction Home uh, the, uh, when he's then mentioning all the people uh, uh, who covered his songs. Uh, um, for those again, the Dylan Dylan fans watching here, um. And uh, um, so uh, if you look at the, the list of people who who participate in your book, everyone from Gary Puckett to all sorts of people, um, uh, uh, and, um, and you want to you want to talk about a little bit about um, you said some of them are in the, from the podcast, but um, how you uh, I guess you I guess you guys just been ne networking for decades or whatever and you just know these people but um well, well, knows everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I've been producing, you know, festivals and music stuff since the 70s, so I kind of like have a nice network of people that I know in 2010 I produced an event called Weekend of 100 Rock Stars, Rock National Rock Con, which took place in the Meadowlands in New Jersey. And uh, I, I became friends with, you know, so many people. Ron Dante is one of the ones that pops out. Um, we keep in touch very often. And of course, he is now kind of the voice of the Turtles. He tours as um, as Howard's place in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Happy Together shows. Mm -hmm. um, but if you know someone, and you know this being, you know, a reporter for so long, you want to reach someone else, you ask, how do I get in touch with? And one person somehow gets to the other person. The tough ones, tough one for us was, was Howard Kalen. I mean, he's not one, to, he's not one to still give interviews. He considers himself retired. He's not touring. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been pursuing him for years. Back in 2010, he actually wrote back to me and said, yeah, I'm a horror guy. I'll give you a list for your horror book. Never did. And I wrote back and wrote back. Um, Plastic EP, who's a podcaster out of Australia, mm -hmm. and I trying to get him to do an interview years, pre-pandemic pre probably, or right around COVID time. And uh, it was, we didn't give up. We just hammered and hammered and hammered. And finally he said yes and, and didn't show up. Said yes again and said he forgot about it. It was one of those, right. we, we didn't give up. And it's good we didn't because, you know, his is one of the great interviews in the book. And, you know, when you get the main guys and you get members of the band and then you get the guys who toured with them. They had a West Coast Turtles and an East Coast Turtles to save money when they would tour, <laughs> you know, one part of the country. It was one set of guys, the other part. Of, and we got guys who, as, as Mark mentioned, who produced them and was so involved with them. And so that's a really big part of the book in, in the interview section with uh, someone like Gary Puckett, who's toured with them forever in the in the Happy Together uh, tours and is a dear friend of mine. So I, I got him to write the, the forward for the book. But you look at the covers. I mean, the front and back cover were, were honored. Henry Diltz, one of the great rock photographers, who's a friend of the Turtles, who's a friend of us. Uh, see, I would hold it up, but it's a blur. Uh, a friend, <laughs> friend of the monkeys, a friend of the doors. You go on and on and on. He gave us two photos that were never published before, never seen before. Found them in his, you know, old archive of slides. And uh, it just, you know, we're really proud of it because it makes that book complete with the interviews, with the forward, with the photos and everything else. 
what I what I like, I'll say to piggyback on that is that you know, uh, Charles has introduced me to people that I would never dream of ever talking to, much less interview them. And you know, I don't know if I can consider any of them my true close friends, but I mean, at least for that half hour to an hour, you know, we had a connection there that you know they were uh asked some questions uh we were interested uh they responded because we we tried to ask intelligent questions that were thought provoking not the same old what's your favorite turtle song you know what was it like you know you know whatever you know we wanted to you know depending on who we were interviewing you wanted to you know really delve deep into you know like with johnny barbeta you know he was one we interviewed just to make sure you know that we touched all the different aspects of his career because yes he was uh with the turtles he was also with jefferson starship and we wanted to talk about all that stuff it makes them more at ease that you know we're not just coming in there asking a quick question just getting out we want to know everything about them and they the, it feeds their ego a little bit but it's great because we get to talk to these people that before we're just spinning around on our turntables so a good example of that is was it bob lind he uh wrote that he had a one hit um elusive, elusive butterfly, butterfly. Yeah, yeah. yeah yep yep you and asked a wrote, question about that yeah yeah <laughs> and he wrote for the uh you know the turtles and he, i said mark you know i'm able to get this guy and yeah. let's let's talk to him you know he's probably you know not doing a sh a ton load of interviews <laughs> and, and he's part of again he's part of our soundtrack of our lives great song great songwriter i bet he would talk about his career and the turtles uh song and and sure enough we added that to the book so yeah. that was you know one of those things you wouldn't normally think you think of turtles you think of the main guys maybe you think of you know what producer or two but we went we, we try to get it a little more uh deep i keep using the word deep but it fits because um the people who were in the book who contributed really were, were very special on so many levels and there are some people that are just friends like spanky mcfarlane or spanky in our gang yes. she wasn't she she might have toured with them but she wasn't a member of the band you know or yeah. anything like that uh, but you know she still has a fondness for them so she has memories that she was able to uh revealed to us in the book so it worked right right good call yes um so let's talk a little about the early days i have um rhino put out a, a crossfires album when they were like a part of a surf band and that right. they the i remember the opening track was a surf version of uh, the william tell overture which i love <laughs> <laughs> so <Silver> um, <laughs> yeah and, I, and um i guess they were called the night riders before anyway the um yeah. so uh can you talk a little bit about the the early days, like like where they, you know, uh, I guess maybe not just um, the two main guys, but you know, uh, how they were that band, and then how they became the Turtles. Before yeah, Mark gives you, before Mark gives you the history, because he's the historian on this one. I just want to say, I didn't know, I didn't know their stuff prior mm -hmm. to Turtles. Uh -huh. and, I, and I loved it. I would put it up against, you know, the Telstars and all, you know, the surf bands of the time. There were not just great rock and surf songs, but some of them were, you know, really novelty. You know, you heard in those songs their personalities. You knew there was that touch of humor even then. And I think you mentioned the uh, the Lone Ranger, the, the overture, um, uh, William Tell overture. Yeah. But there was a bunch of those things in there in the songs. And I thought, my gosh, uh, right on my Spotify, along with the Ventures and along with Dick, Dale, I'm putting the Crossfires, and I fell in love with their instrumental stuff. And now, Mark, you can all right. <laughs> um, well, the odd thing is, is you know, you mentioned the Rhino record album. That mm -hmm. didn't come out until the '80s, actually. And so, um, what originally came out? I mean, uh, the four of the Turtles were in a Westchester High School uh, choral group, or uh, and uh, eventually uh, they broke out and, you know, learned instruments and everything. There's a long story about who did what and everything. Um, Al Nickel was originally a surf guitarist. And so he, he knew how to play all the good surf licks and everything that everybody is accustomed to hearing when you hear a surf song. So um, the rest of them played uh, drums or, or, you know, in the case of Howard and Mark, well, Howard was the vocalist, uh, but he didn't consider himself the leader or anything because he didn't play an instrument. Uh, Mark Volman 
wasn't even in the band and he kind of was jealous of this or whatever he wanted to be part of it somehow and they go well you don't sing you don't play anything you don't do anything what do you do and so his dad actually helped him get in by buying him a saxophone and uh (laughs) howard got one too and so they kind of you know if you watch the turtles documentary they honk their way through the hits you know as it were um they managed to get a couple uh 45s released in those formative years as the crossfires um i don't remember all the titles but one of the songs is called one potato two potato did nothing on the national charts but on the local charts back then you know small labels could get something on a local chart and you um one thing led to another uh they became the house band for this uh one club which is in the book i don't remember it off the top of my head sorry that's why you have a book (laughs) anyway uh but uh the guys uh effectively that ran the club became their first managers just basically because they said we're your managers and so they go okay (laughs) <laughs> they were young kids they were high school kids it's unbelievable how young these guys were they were younger than the beatles were in a certain sense the beatles by the time they signed their main contracts half of them or if not all of them were in their early 20s you know it's like but the you know the turtles were still in their teens mid-teens and stuff um so uh they uh kind of had to go by the whim of what these guys said and they were the ones that said, oh, you should change your name from the Crossfires to the Turtles because it kind of sounds like the Beatles. And they were like against it totally at first because it's like, eh, Turtles are slow and uh, and everything like that. Um, the other thing on the Turtles is that, you know, they started off as a surf band, but then they, they kind of always had an identity crisis, which for me, I love. You know, it's like I love that the first album or so is like kind of folky. Then, you know, it moves on into pop, you know, and then it kind of gets into psychedelia. And then they get by the end before they break up some really mature sounding songs and ideas. Um, I don't know if that completely answers your question, about, but that's kind of the evolution of how they became from the Crossfires into the Turtles. So. And um, so um so they uh all right so they they um had a low budget and they made their own records and uh so and uh you know they they were having hit after hit as i said um you know uh i I think until the internet i didn't realize these were all the same you know i knew all the songs it's the same thing with paul revere and the raiders they had a bunch of hits and i didn't know it was all theirs either um you know and uh we we lived in such primitive times growing up (laughs) and um uh and so but and <laughs> anyway so so they, they're going on and they 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 end up playing the next big thing i guess was frank zappa right that after well, well why don't you explain the transition up? from the turtles to playing with okay. frank zappa and also well, i'll say that we'll back up a few steps so right. i mean one thing that their label even though it was kind of small called white whale one they 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 were good at is getting hit 45s out there um, because they actually had a few hit the 45s that didn't have the turtles albums not so good <laughs> you know, i think the only top 10 album the the label ever had was the turtles golden hits golden and hits, that was yeah. a compilation and it made it to number seven um of the turtles albums themselves the happy together album only peaked at 25 had they been on a major label they probably would have had top five on every one of their albums you know it, it's just kind of amazing the second album didn't even chart yeah, so it's like, um, but uh, you know, they they kept um, basically continuing on as the Turtles as long as they were being funded to tour and to put out albums, and they generated a lot of money. You know, so I mean, they did audits and everything, which you know got them in trouble later on with you know uh, legal reasons of people uh, uh, embezzling money from them and other stuff like that. It's mm-hmm. all in the book. But uh, when it, you know, finally came to an end, it just basically came to an end because White Wheel came to an end. And um, we interviewed Jerry Yester, who was in The Love and Spoonful. He was producing their final album. And uh, basically, yeah, it was just one day. There was a lock, a padlock and chains on the door. You couldn't go into the studio. And everyone was at a loss of what to do. 
um i explain where everyone went but you know and it, it's kind of funny when you think of something when you're young you know oh it was like months and everything it might have been as maximum of about two weeks that they really didn't have a career direction because Zappa already knew of the turtles. He's in the LA scene with all the other guys, all the other groups and everything like that. Uh, he wanted uh, his original mothers of invention had broken up because he couldn't afford to keep them on the payroll because he was just paying these guys just to sit there <laughs> and not tour sometimes. And so he had to change that plan. So his next step was to make a new set of mothers. Um, one of the people he actually asked, but he turned it down, was Mickey Dolenz. <laughs> and uh, so he was looking for some good vocalists. Um, when Mickey turned him down, then, you know, his next choice was Howard Kalin. Uh, Howard had the foresight or forethought to say, I work as a team with my buddy Mark here. So, you know, that's why they came together. Otherwise, it would have just been Mark. But... Uh, out of all the other turtles, you know, Mark and uh, uh, Howard were, you know, they were buds. They were, they yeah, were, yeah, they were happy together. Yeah, oh. I mean, the, you know, during the time the turtles were together, the only constant was Al Nickel. Um, all the other people came and went over for various reasons. You know, some people got tired of touring. Some people uh, had families to raise. You know, because now these guys, by the end of it, were in their early to mid twenties, and so. You know, they they had other career ideas than just playing in a band their whole life. So, but Mark and Howard, they they love the rock and roll life. They love that. Uh, Zappa promised them that they would go on tour and that they would sing, and they did. You know, so they promptly in the middle of 1970 uh, recorded a quick album called Chunga's Revenge, and then they went on tour and they basically toured for the next year and a half non-stop you know throughout the u.s and canada i think a little bit and in europe and unfortunately in europe is where the trouble happened <laughs> um the if i i don't know if you know your i'm sure you know your history of you know smoke on the water by deep purple well that's the venue where all their instruments they were playing a concert and somebody lit a flare and uh the venue burnt completely down they lost all their instruments and everything mm -hmm. and and uh zappa asked the rest of the band if they wanted to continue and they said yeah let's continue so they went to england oh, like a couple days later a week later or something had to rent instruments played another concert at this concert uh some strange person at the end of the concert was jealous of zappa because he thought Zappa was making eyes at his girlfriend or something. Yeah. Push Zappa off the stage at the end of the concert into the orchestra pit. Zappa could have died. Uh, he didn't, but he got severely bashed up and broken legs and had to be in a wheelchair. So that effectively ended the mothers for another couple of years. So, uh, you know, I could go on to the next part of the story, but Flo and Eddie and the rest of them were kind of out of work again. And this is an uh, end of uh, 1971 going into 72. Now, what do we do? <laughs> um, so uh, th they were there for the 200 motels, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I, my, my parents took me to see that, me and my sister. <laughs> yeah, <you're a> kid. <laughs> it, it was a double feature with Yellow Submarine. <laughs> wow. <I'll, I'll, laughs> the Union Dale I'll, mini cinema on Long Island. They had a lot of all the cool movies. I'll, I'll share a story with you. I went to see um, uh, Theodore Bikel. He was doing a... A fundra Israel fundraiser or something. And I went backstage afterwards and, you know, he had a small line of people who were greeting him. And I brought a, a poster from 200 motels. And I said, would you sign this for me? And he went, Oh God, did you have to remind me? <laughs> he, said, he dreaded that so much. And, and I had it more because it was a, a Ringo connection than right. anything else um, but <laughs> he just he just cringed at the thought of the movie but it was one of those you know of the time magical mystery tour had 200 motels you know it was one of those freaky films and uh yeah Flo and Eddie were definitely involved in that and and you know I you can see why Zappa liked them yeah they were great singers but they were also nuts I mean they were personalities <laughs> And, you know, for me, you think of the bands like the Beatles and the Monkees and the Turtles. Those are all groups that um, with their personalities shine through. They had humor. They had talent. 
but you know they they weren't afraid to be funny and cheeky and if you ever saw Flo and Eddie on stage you will remember that forever because it's not just their songs it's them teasing each other it's them making fun of other artists it's it's poking fun of uh the audience and that always I, I you would I would never leave a turtle show or a happy together tour show bored or or unsatisfied because beyond the music it was always personality and they were entertaining and uh and then Flo and Eddie became radio DJs for a while yes. yeah which which oh, ended which, which it would have ended with some flair <laughs> not a flair yeah. like in, not like smoke on the water <laughs> um, although that's not the, what their original intention were I mean they 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 were stuck at the end of and Zappa got uh stuck in the hospital uh, but the rest of the band decided, well, we can still tour. And that's when they toured with Alice Cooper and everything. And uh, they kept the same band together, at least for the first couple albums. And then, you know, did a few albums later. But yeah, they kept uh, doing different things like being radio DJs. They had to keep working. You know, <laughs> you know it's kind of funny, even though uh, they looked like older men because, you know, Howard always had that gray to white hair. Mm -hmm. he was a young guy you know he's like in his 30s and you know it's like you know you need they need to keep working so you know it's like that's the way they did and you know they could have just hung it up and got you know desk job somewhere or something else <laughs> yeah, but, yeah I, don't, I don't think you so. know <laughs> <laughs> uh that wasn't in their nature i mean one of the lucky things that happened while they're um uh flow and eddie is around 1973 or four uh the white wheel uh assets went up for auction and uh so unlike the beatles where they never really got the rights back to their own music uh flo and eddie as mark and howard you know were able to purchase their own tunes outright and own them you know it's like incredible you know it's something that you know d didn't seem possible a few years before and, and recently they had a uh, they uh we're trying to get more royalties from uh, Sirius XM as well. Oh yeah, and Spotify well, and things like that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> different differing outcomes on that. You know, there's always appeals and everything. So, um, but you know, they have made a mint mainly on the song "Happy Together," but you know, on on some of their other songs because they keep reissuing. So they're not really hurting. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's sad about the Sirius case because even though they won the case you will never hear a, a turtle song on any of their channels to the fact that um if they do a top 10 of a certain year mm -hmm. they will do one through 10 and skip the number that happy together was ever on <laughs> um so the, you know it's they're one of those bands that if you go through their history it was endless um, uh, controversies and issues with management. I think Bill Cosby, somewhere down the line, was one of their managers somehow. And they would fire a manager and get a new manager. And then four managers later, they'd go back to the old manager. And <laughs> so if, if you want to read uh, how to succeed in the music industry without really trying um <laughs> you, you can go by the turtles and if you want to read how to sabotage your careers uh by really trying you could read the and there's so many ways you can decipher the turtles um non-musical history which is just as fascinating and, and it is amazing they almost came they came out almost unscathed you know it's like the, in the long run but man yeah <laughs> go ahead uh, so um, I'm uh, I'm just gonna bring um, uh, mention a couple of names I've, I mentioned before, but maybe just a, a little more uh, commentary. So uh, uh, near the end of, of their career, I think, as the Turtles, uh, so Ray Davis produced them, uh, Turtle Soup, right? That was that album, right? Yeah. So what? Um, how was that? How did you know? What What can you say about that? I think it should have been monstrously successful. Um, but some reason it didn't click. I don't think it was the right marriage of styles. And I and and I think we differ a lot, Mark, when we review some of the Ray Davis songs because um whereas some of them I wow, this was could have been a hit had it been some other, you know, uh, maybe other producer or other style. Um uh but but 
in, in on paper, in theory, the kinks and the turtles. Well, how could it go wrong? Right. <laughs> well, um, one of the things they said, you know, this is the turtles themselves, is they wanted an album to sound like the kinks. And yeah. the way Ray said is he wanted it to sound more like the turtles or someone else, you know. And so right. <laughs> if you don't have that agreement with right. how you want your album to sound, it's going to be very discordant. So. <laughs> So true. <laughs> um, and do, do you know how they even interacted? Uh, do, do you know how they even crossed paths? Or is it just the music business kind of? Um, th their previous album to that was called uh, The Turtles uh, Present the Battle of the Bands, which is my favorite album by them. That one was produced by Chip Douglas, but Chip had this, uh, not love, hate, that's too extreme, but you know, just kind of in, out experience where he kept going waffling back and forth between the monkeys and the turtles depending on you know where the next you know whatever was you right. know the uh next career move i guess for the lack of a better term but you know uh so after that album came out it wasn't terribly successful because as i said white whales albums didn't do well it's an excellent album though because it does have you showed me and uh Eleanor on it so I mean it, it, it even if you know for that alone you know two big hits on one album it should have been a bigger hit but uh afterwards they felt like we're on top we're taking control of our careers we're starting to write material we want to have new expressions of our ideas and then they started throwing out names they even threw out George Martin you know it's like George Martin was still at the Beatles so probably not going to get to him you know but you know and then, you know, Ray Davis was one of the ones that they thought of because they had just done Village Green Preservation Society. Um, and he said, you know, they thought that was an incredible album sonically and compositionally. And they thought, you know, this would work. And Ray agreed to do it. He flew from uh, England, came out and worked with them in L.A. for a few months or weeks or I don't know how long. But, you know, and, you know, it would have worked better if they had come to an agreement of how they were supposed to sound, but you know, oh well. I, I wish we could have gotten Ray uh, to to interview and just talk yeah. about that project because coming off a of battle of the bands where the turtle showed such diversity, you know, they weren't just now an AM hit, you know, la 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 band. They, they were getting deeper. Each each track had its own identity as if it was different bands playing a lot of the songs. And I think Chip did a great job of producing that, but um, I would have liked to have spoken to Ray and say why he thought they should have sounded like they did the turtles and why the turtles wanted a Kinks album and why it didn't uh, connect the way it maybe it should have. Right. Now that being said, turtle soup is an incredible album, you know, with its flaws, you know, it's like, yeah. So I wouldn't dismiss it from their catalog at any at any point. So. And uh, and the other uh, uh, person is uh, Warren Zevon, the great Warren Zevon. So uh, what's the connection there? He wrote a couple of their songs, but uh, you know, at the top of my head, I don't remember which ones they were. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, where's the index? Where's the yeah, index? The, the, <laughs> look uh, in the index. <laughs> yes, it might be under line because he did. He, he, strangely enough, he did his compositions uh, under um, a pseudonym, which is really weird. But he wasn't known as Warren Z Zevon. Oh, okay, it says Lime C Zevon Warren, so it does have a. <laughs> well, we have him in there. We have him in a bunch of pages. Yeah, so there we go. 13 34 55 80 81 94 there we go those are the pages look it up everybody after you buy the book so <laughs> a, lot, a, lot, a lot of warren's Yvon fans uh you know yeah. cross over to bob dylan of course so you're yeah. right you have you have like the like the seasons uh and it's written as lime aka warren's Yvonne. you hit that right note and um I had actually a lot to say about that. Uh, and Mark had very little to say about that, but it was um, originally released as a single and never charted. Mm. You know, and and Zivon, you know, maybe it's because no, and he played guitar on it. So maybe it's because uh, Zivon wasn't that name that he is known years later. And yeah. a lot of that I think happens, you know, when uh, Harry Nilsson is an exception, but if, if you put a name on record, it has a better chance sometimes of being a hit 
as you know. Um, and I think the fact that something like It Ain't Me Babe was a Dylan song reimagined, I think that that gave it more credibility uh, as just, you know, than, than a regular hit. And, you know, Mark and I say uh, about that one song, you know, the Beatles gave us yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Turtles and Dylan gave us no, 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 it ain't me. <laughs> So I don't know how I answered that uh, in regards to Warren Zevon, but uh, I I think that um, the the hit, what he wrote for them should have gotten a lot more attention. Um, and so uh, I guess the, the the other major category of their accomplishments that we haven't gotten put into much detail is is the backing vocals they've done for uh, hit records. I mean, the, the two that come to mind are, are Bang a Gong, Get It On, and by T-Rex, and which is their biggest hit, and Hungry Heart by Bruce Springsteen, which is, was his first top 10 record, I think. Um, and they're even on the, li the live version on the box set, uh, whatever, se was it 75 to 85, whatever it's called. Um, they, they actually perform live with Bruce, and they put that on the box set. Um, so um, uh, I guess in general, do you want to talk about them as, I mean, I, you know, Alice Cooper, like every, the, who haven't they sung with? I mean, you know, it might always be like a short <laughs> list. Um, do you totally. just want to talk about them and, and their, and well, actually I just thought of this now, but like their voices themselves, like, like, like <clears throat> and I, I just think of them as one, you know what I mean? I, I don't even, I yeah. never even thought about like, who's, who's, who, does one have a higher voice or lower voice? I didn't even think about it. Like, so like, you want to talk about them, at, I guess, as vocalists and then as, um, and some of the, uh, maybe some of your favorite things that maybe we don't know that they sang on. I think it's, I think it's Howard as the lead vocalist. Mm -hmm. And I think of Mark as the harmonist, the guy who does the harmony, either lower or higher part, depending on what the song needed and very underrated because he had a great ear for that. And together it was, they could blend but more often it was, you know, them thinking Lennon McCartney, let's do a great harmony on something. <laughs> um, yeah, you mentioned all those acts. And it what, what it proved is that the people in the industry, the music people knew of them and wanted them on their tracks as background vocalists, whereas the general public only knew, you know, those hits and the Turtles were this, you know, AM radio band, but they were so much more than that. Um, what wasn't it? The didn't they also do the theme song for Gary Shandling years later? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people totally forget about that. And that's it's just a great piece of pop, quick, not disposable, but a great, you know, theme song that was earwaxed. You heard that once, you always heard it. So those are some of the examples that jump out for me, as examples of things that people might not have otherwise known when they didn't know the complete history. But uh, I'll defer to you, Mark, for more of that. Well, um, I'm looking in our very book on page 437, but <laughs> these are some of the things that they've sang on that you may not know that they were on. Um, uh, they were on Steely Dan's Everyone's Gone to the Movies, only the demo, but still, you know, that's, you know, uh, they were on Ray Manzarek's uh, solo albums. They were on a Roger McGinn solo album. Uh, they were on a David Cassidy album in the mid '70s. And actually, if you look on um, YouTube, uh, there is a video with Flo and Eddie singing with David Cassidy. I think we oh, put cool. a still of it in in our <laughs> yeah. book. So you know, uh, they sang on Keith Moon's only solo album, uh, which which I love. I don't know what you think. I love that album. <laughs> Great album. Yeah, I love that. Album. Uh, they were on one of Stephen Stills' albums. They were on two of uh, Alice Cooper's albums. Here's one for you. They were on Blondie's Auto American. That's the album with the tide is high and rapture. You know? mm -hmm. So uh, they were on Psychedelic First, Forever Now album. Uh, Paul, Paul Kantner's uh, Planet Earth Rock and Roll Orchestra. Andy Taylor's solo album. I guess the guy from Dan Duran Duran. Um, mm -hmm. Jefferson yep. Airplane, the reunion album, the one they did in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and Southside Johnny and the Ashbury Duke Jukes. And so, you know, wide variety of uh people you know that they've worked with um they were like us you know they came across all these talents probably through their radio show probably through the record connections probably going on tour so you know it's like everybody knew them everybody loved them but uh yeah i mean they had the great harmonies because they started out as i said in the high school choral group you know in the chorus you know and so they learned how to sing and uh that, you know, uh, if you want to hear them all solo, you know, one of the interesting things is right before Turtle Soup 
came out or you know right after a battle of the bands howard actually left the group for a brief period of time uh so the rest of the band actually carried on and kept recording with their each person taking a lead vocal it talks about each one in the book so if you went and then when howard came back he wanted to re-record his vocals and they said "Uh uh-uh you know so it is a more group sounding album because of that because they all you know contributed at least one lead vocal and you can definitely hear the difference between mark's and howard's voices very similar but uh howard definitely has the stronger voice but as he should for being the lead vocalist so yeah anyway and uh and just in uh in closing the uh so um uh you know and Flo and eddie had their own hits i mean i'm mean, uh, about chart it's certainly on um fm radio i remember keep it warm keep it warm yeah, keep it warm yeah warm. keep it warm i used they, we, they used to play that all the time but um yeah. they they you know uh, fm radio would play their stuff i remember and um yeah uh well, one of flo and eddie's hits i thought should have been a hit and it probably would have if it was the turtles maybe the subject matter maybe not i don't know but let me make love to you you mm-hmm. know should have been a hit rebecca should have been a hit uh uh I even like Mama Open Up. <laughs> that should have been it. Um, you know, it's like, and you know, by that point in Flo and Eddie's career, they were on a major label at that point, Columbia Records. Um, but unfortunately, Columbia didn't know what to do with them either. And so I guess they just kind of got lost in the shuffle amongst the many Chicago albums and Billy Joel albums and everybody else that was putting out hit singles in the mid 70s. And, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess no one ever. What can you do? No one ever. You know, I'm. I'm just thinking. It's one of the things. I, the first things I want to say, but they were just an unusual group because they had just two lead singers in a band. I mean, that was. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess the Jefferson Airplane, and there were, there were probably others that come to mind, but um, like two guys, um, uh, incredibly incredible voices. Um, maybe not like the teen idol sort of look, but they they were. Um, <laughs> incredibly they sang talented. with teen idols they weren't teen idols <laughs> <laughs> and um you know uh you know just uh, i guess from the beginning they i guess that was they they couldn't fit into any sort of category and it, they sort of wherever they went as you as you were saying earlier they went every they just people found them or they found something to do no matter what adversity they they um they faced they overcame it and yeah i, I think it's because they were always self-aware I mean, in the Turtles uh, documentary, one of the things said is once they started singing, you know, they go, hey, they started getting accepted and they go, hey, you're not just a Neil Sedaka looking nerd. You can sing. <laughs> you know? And that's Howard's own uh, uh, <laughs> memories of himself, you know, or whatever <laughs> recollections, you know, and yeah, he's not far off, you know, it's like because he was always kind of stocky you know in the early days he had his hair was kind of like uh sunny bonos you know and then later on you know as it went on you know as flo and eddie let it all hang out and had the long beard and you know the long white hair you know and it was very distinguished for what he was doing so it worked flo main you know mark volman in the meantime he just had the big frizzy hair and you know as time went on he let it grow and grow and grow you know <laughs> and so you know Look, they were um, they were characters, guys, yeah. and then, and they didn't they didn't have any. They knew they weren't David Cassidy. They knew yeah. they weren't Teen Idols. They weren't going to be on the cover of Sixteen or Tiger Beat, and they didn't care. It was all about the music. It was all about personality, and uh, that for me that made him special. You look at every picture, and and you know Howard, he looks like you know he looks like a porn star or or a guy you know who's walking across. You run on the other side, and and Volman looks like someone. Yeah, come on, let's have a beer together. You know, that's the impression you got from them. You didn't uh, certainly not Lennon McCartney, and certainly not you know the teen idols of the day. But that's okay. I mean, that again, all those things set them aside, and and to me made it's made them special. All right. So um, all right. So uh, the official name of the book is. Not just happy together, the turtles from A to Z, AM radio to Zappa. And um, the website is www.notjusthappytogether.com. And it's eight and a half by 11, Mark was telling me. Yes. <laughs> it's a bigger, it's a big book. It's a and, big uh, book. You know, it has lots of 
lots of color inside. See, color. Ooh, it's a color heavy, heavy, I guess they call them coffee tabletop books. Or it's, it's, a, it's its own coffee table. It's just like <laughs> outside. <laughs> um, yeah, so excellent. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this would be, this is, I mean, uh, you know, I was looking through it. It's just like, like, so much information i mean you can look at it forever i mean it's just like tons and tons of research obviously a lot of love was put in this book obviously um it, um just when i so you know so what you guys did beforehand i knew it was going to be a great book because you guys been doing this forever and and really love the music especially of that era and um uh, yeah go ahead and buy it and uh, is it is it available only from their website is it available anywhere else i think it's also available on amazon and in my basement, if you want to stop by, just knock on the door. <laughs> a few boxes of them ready to sell. <laughs> um, Charles is also, he's being silly, but, you know, he also is selling them at various conventions. And he could probably tell you about them, various live appearances and things like that. I'll be doing a couple live appearances on my end. I'm in the West Coast. He's on the East Coast. Uh, I have a comic convention coming up in Salem, Oregon in the mid-April. And uh one in San Jose, California in the beginning of May. So I'll have copies there. And, uh, you know, Charles has some if he wants to promote them. <laughs> at the end of April, I'll be at the Chiller Theater Expo in the Meadowlands in New Jersey, which is a big celebrity signing convention, uh, rock stars and actors and all that. So I'll have all my books there. And then uh, probably November, looking way ahead, there's a show in Boxborough, one of those collector events that Gary Summers puts on in Boxborough, Massachusetts. And I'll be there with all the books as well. So um, we're, you know, whenever there's a convention that's fun and we can sign copies, we'll be there. Box bar is near me. <laughs> right, that's why I mentioned it. <laughs> and um, and so my final question is, Mark, what's in what's behind you? <laughs> what are all what's those boxes? Me? Yeah, what's all uh, that? I'll pull them. Boxes, are my boxes and boxes of his unsold books. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> um, there are actually magazines in most of the boxes. In fact, uh, uh, recently I'm I'm finishing up the indexing on a two volume Mad book called Unconditionally Mad. And Mad magazine, those, yeah. Oh, cool. And so in, in those boxes are boxes and boxes of like every Mad magazine. So, you know, and I did literally go through all of them. You know, I, I was working on it partially at the same time when I was working on this, and before. You know, this mm -hmm. book took about three years. Uh, the Mad books taken about five years, and some overlap. You know, so there we are. <laughs> so if something so someone else, something else. To look forward to any other projects you guys working on. We're working on a monkeys project, which we hope will be out by Christmas Hanukkah time, if not early next year. And it's going to be really special. Oh, wow. Well, uh, are you both working on it? Yeah. Or, oh, yeah. Well, I love it. I love the monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, I, uh, oh, man. Uh, that well, well, you know, you, well, you, have a, you have an open invitation when that when that's um, when out. If um, thank you. If our, anything... our, our bigger picture goal. Uh, and it's just not our goal, of course, is to to see the turtles and the monkeys in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame someday. Both are so deserved. Yeah, sure, there's Paul Revere and the Raves. There's plenty of others. I get it. But those two are on the top of our list. And we hope that the turtles book and eventually the monkeys book will help uh, that campaign to push it through a little quicker. Well, now that Jan Winter is gone, uh, hopefully, um, hopefully that 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 blockage is is has been removed. Yeah. And uh, uh, okay. yeah, I mean, it's you know, and I mean, my you know, I and I guess it's kind of obvious. I mean, I think the reason they they keep on uh, uh, nominating all these people who have nothing to do with rock and roll is to get more people into the building. I mean, if you know, it's just like, well, if if you if you add Jethro Tull, it's not gonna it's great as they were or whatever. It's like it's not gonna add more people. But if you have Mary J. Blige, it's a different audience, and hopefully they'll make more money, which is what it's all about, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> but on that happy note, uh, this has been a real pleasure. I really I really enjoyed looking at the book. I really uh, enjoyed talking to you guys. Uh, when the Monkey Book comes out, um, uh, I want to talk to you again. And uh, the Mad Magazine, I, you know, I remember the first one I got. It had a, uh, this is a Mad bumper sticker, bumper sticker in the, in the <laughs> I think it was like some 1967. Um, gonna, all right. Well, got to end this sometime. I, I got to share a Mad story with you guys. <laughs> okay. Before I published Beatles Magazine for 20 years, Good Day Sunshine. I've done four books. Mark's done a hundred books. My first ever printed anything 
was in Mad Magazine. I wrote one of the letters to the editor and it was printed. It was the Towering Inferno cover. I don't know what number. <laughs> so Mark and I had a connection with that even before he subscribed to Good Day Sunshine and yeah. we didn't even know each other in those years. So it And I do mention it in the book, so <laughs> it will be in there. Because <laughs> you're like, a celebrity of sorts. So oh, it's yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So get the book one more time, the website www.notjusthappytogether.com from Genius Music Books, Genius Publishing. Uh, and it's a treasury. People people will love it. Yeah, anyone who's a music fan is, would love this. And, you know, if, if you want to, the holidays are coming up, right? It's only February. <laughs> <laughs> Some holidays. Valentine's. Birthday. Valentine's. Everybody Valentine's. Has a, exactly. Everybody has at least one birthday. So. Yeah, that's right, every year. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Well, um, yeah, it's like it's like revisiting, revisiting my childhood. Mad Magazine, the, the monkeys, and the turtles, and everything. It's fun. What I do. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, all right. Well, uh, say goodbye and uh, thanks again. Thank you both.